The 1987 baseball season concludes tonight. The seventh game of the World Series under the dome in Minneapolis. The St. Louis Cardinals against the Minnesota Twins. It's McGrain against Viola. I'm Al Michaels, and isn't this the way it should be? You start at the end of February, and you finish it on the 25th of October, one game for the championship. This is the 84th World Series. This is the 31st time it has gone to a seventh game. And for what it's worth, 17 of the prior 30 have been won by the visiting teams. No World Series has ever gone the route with the home team winning every game, and certainly the Twins hope to accomplish that tonight. Tim McCarver, you're a man who played in three seventh games with the Cardinals in 64 and 67 and 68, and certainly the St. Louis Cardinals are no strangers to seventh games. Well, I, sh I should say not. As a matter of fact, the last seven World Series in which the Cardinals have participated dated back to 1946. All seven series have gone to seven games. The odds on that, 3,400 to 1. And speaking of odds, what are the odds on a rookie starting the seventh game of the World Series? Well, in the 10 series that the Cardinals have played seven games, no rookie has ever started. And tonight it'll be Joe McGrain, the left-hander on the mound. Joe with an 11-9 record this year. And I don't really believe that, that it's going to be a problem physically for McGrain tonight. I believe that uh, facing the, uh, from a mental standpoint, the intense heat that the crowd can put on young players, especially here in the Metrodome, is going to be the major problem. And if he falters early on two days rest, it would be Danny Cox in, in long relief. Well, Tim played in three seventh games. Jim Palmer has been a part of a couple of teams. Baltimore that went to a seventh game on two occasions. What's the mood like in the clubhouse before a seventh game? Well, what's so interesting is about the two World Series that I didn't play in, but I watched, which was 1971 and 1979. We were poised to win. We had the right people out there, and we were always thwarted by one or two players. 1971, Steve Blass beat us 2-1. to one. Roberto Clemente with great hitting. And then in 1979, Scotty McGregor on the mound for the Orioles. Willie Stargell with a home run to beat us. And if you go back to 1965 with the Twins here in Minneapolis, Sandy Koufax on two days rest comes out of nowhere to shut him out with 10 strikeouts, 2 to nothing. But the most interesting thing about baseball to me as a former player is when I go back and think about a baseball season, exhibition games, about 30 of them, 162 games that you trudge through and you battle through a playoff. Then you get to a World Series and you find yourself all of a sudden in a seventh game. You know what to do to win, but only one team can win. Put your feet up and settle back. It's a magical phrase in itself. The seventh game of the World Series. <coughs> Line. With us tonight are three individuals who each in their own way have contributed greatly to the success of Minnesota baseball. Baseball first honors the former president of the Twins, who continues to serve as the club's executive committee, Mr. Howard Fox. Mr. Fox will present baseballs to each of tonight's two honored guests. We now honor the man who brought baseball to the Twin Cities in 1961, the former owner of the Twins, Mr. Calvin Griffin. Baseball in Minnesota in 1984, Mr. Carl Polad. <laughs> Gentlemen, the stage is set for Game Seven of the World Series. Fire when ready. Jose Okendo is in right. 
Tom Wallace, the big hero the other night in St. Louis, and Steve Lake is the catcher. It is Lake's first start in the World Series. He and McGrain work well. Pena DHs. Gladden, Puckett, and Brunanski in the Minnesota outfield with Gaetti, Gagne, Lombardozzi, and Herbeck, who hit the Grand Slam yesterday, comprising the infield. Tim Laudner, back of the plate, and Frank Viola, who pitched game one and pitched game four, now pitches again in the seventh game. The inside pitch on Frank from the Milwaukee Brewers, Paul Molitor. Frank Viola's development of a changeup over the past two years has taken him from being a good pitcher to a great pitcher. The one thing he has to be careful about there is he occasionally might tip his pitches, holding his fastball lower in the glove as opposed to his changeup or his breaking ball, which he holds higher up into the webbing. The Cardinals should have some success stealing third against him, but he does a very good job of holding runners on first base. So Frank Viola, who pitched so well in game one and not very well in game four when Tom Lawless Homer to three run Homer that was the big blow to knock him out comes back with three days rest Jim. Oh it certainly was and he was so overpowering had a great change up in the first game and then in game four first to admit everything was up couldn't get his change up over made a mistake to Lawless for the three run home run but you are looking at one of the best pitchers in the American League and of all of baseball trailing only Dwight Gooden in wins along with Jack Morris and we're talking about the winningest left hander in baseball over the last four years 17 wins this year 16 18 and 18. So the crowd already standing and picking up where they left off yesterday when the twins wanted to send it to seven and here we go with Vince Coleman to start things off Coleman Smith and her. Vince Coleman, who hit 268 during the regular season right-handed and really having his problems from this side in postseason. Well, that's a good starting point if you want to try to beat the Cardinals, keep him off base. As Paul Molitor says, if you get on, Viola has a good move. Only five successful steals out of 21 attempts. Game seven begins with a curve for a strike. And there must have been a thousand flash bowls popping as well. Dave Phillips with the rotation is the same umpire who was behind the plate in game one and he called that game with Viola pitching so he knows him very well not only from regular season but from postseason. Oh two. Also, excuse me one of the best umpires in the American League. In fact Joe McGrain was asking. I, I, hard to believe he can't remember how he umpired back in the first game but as Whitey said he sometimes on planning seven but a good consistent umpire the one you want behind the plate for a big game. Viola ahead, 0-2 on Coleman. Got him. Well, that's something we did not see in St. Louis. They said he was much quicker in the first game in Minneapolis than he was in St. Louis, and this is a 90-plus fastball. Coleman can't catch up. Cardinal hitters will tell you, I don't know if it's the background or whatever, but it's harder to see the ball here. They saw it much better in Bush Stadium. Now Ozzie Smith breaking ball low the other night in game one Viola started the game by getting Coleman on a comebacker in game four as he did here he struck Coleman out. Smith hit 249 this season right handed 335 the other way. So another advantage for the twins tonight is they are able to turn around Coleman turn around Smith Two and, oh. and also turn around Tommy her and Jose Okendo together they are two for twenty five I should say among the four of them two for twenty five from the right side so only Willie McGee has been able to thwart the left handed pitching of the twins so far. In the air to right center field, Puckett moves toward the gap and gets it. Quickly two down here in the first inning with the bases empty. And Tommy Herr coming up. And you have to stand that close, even if you're the home club, as Brunanski and Puckett have to go mouth to ear for communication. 
think when you talk to all the Cardinals, they, that's what they say. It's communication. You have to never can take your eye off a fly ball. You can't hear the guy next to you. Can't If you're coming in from center field, you really can't hear an infielder calling off a ball. Tommy Herr hit a home run yesterday. The Cardinals in this World Series have hit two home runs. Herr yesterday and, of course, Lawless the other night. But in the six games, St. Louis has been limited to nine extra base hits. Twins have 18, including seven homers. Two of them. Well, Whitey in that interview in the pregame hit the nail on the head as you take a look at Whitey. He said, we got to stay close. If we do, he thinks that the advantage tilts towards the Cardinals. They can run on just about all the relievers except maybe Schatzader. Speaking of tilting, Whitey in a new position. He's out of his lawn chair and onto the bench. We and rarely see him sitting on the bench with the players. And in between the battery of McGrain and Lake. Yeah. Little grounder to third. Gary Gaetti turns it into out number three, and the Cardinals are gone in order after a half. St. Louis nothing, and Minnesota coming up. Lineup tonight for Minnesota, Dan Gladden leading off. It's the same lineup they used yesterday to score 11 with. Gagne batting second. Kirby Puckett had a big day. He was four for four, hits third. Cleanup hitter is Gary Gaetti. D.H. Don Baylor, big fifth inning homer yesterday and three RBIs. Brunanski batting in the sixth spot. Ken Herbeck, who hit the grand slam, batting seventh. Tim Laudner does the catching. Steve Lombardozzi at second base. So the Twins very much going with the lineup which got them here, while the Cardinal lineup is obviously because of the injuries and other problems somewhat skewed. Joe McGrain, the pitcher, the inside pitch on him from the Padres, Tony Gwynn. I had a lot of trouble hitting Joe McGrain this year. Uh, he throws a fastball, breaking ball, changeup. Uh, but his best pitch is a fastball. And he sinks it, he runs it in and out. Uh, but I think the Minnesota Twins will have an opportunity to steal some bases against Joe. Even though he's left-handed, he's real deliberate going to the plate. Tony Gwynn, the National League batting champion, so he should know. Outfield, Coleman, McGee, and Okendo. Infield, Lawless at third, Smith at short, Her at second, and Lindemann at first. This is their lineup against left-handed pitching. Steve Lake does the catching with Pena as the DH and McGrain on the mound to face Dan Glad. And Steve Lake should neutralize the weaknesses that Joe McGrain has in his move to first base. He's a better throwing catcher right now than Tony Pena. And they'll try to keep Gladden off the bases, and that's been difficult. Gladden has a hit in all six games. He's the only player on either team to boast of that, and he looks at a strike. Gladden, Gagney, and Puckett in the bottom of the first with no score. Joe McGain, very bright, very articulate, and loves his flaky image. Gets it over for a strike, and it's 0-2. And he can also pitch when he's healthy. Started out the season 5-0 and then had some elbow problems. Went 2-7 and seven, and then 1-2 to go 9-7. and seven. Big game, 1-0 game on September 29th. And you, know, you, you look at 1-0, he said he was really in control. He wasn't. He was all over the place. Seems already with two pitches, he got pretty good control. And just misses inside, 1-2. And, and that's that big breaking ball that Tony Gwynn talked about. He would like to be able to run the ball away from the right-handed hitters, run the ball away from Ken Herbeck, and get his breaking ball over. When he gets ahead, he'll come inside, but basically wants to throw that sinker away. That's grounded and stopped by Lindemann. Shovels to McGrain. Nice play for the out. One gun here in the first inning. So they keep Gladden off the base pass, and it'll bring up Gagne. Well, that was a triple yesterday, Timmy. You see, this is almost the same swing, same ball, maybe a little bit more to the right of the bag, but instead of Dreesen being there, Lindemann is there and smothers the ball and makes a nice play. One out, Gagne is the hitter. Greg struggling in the series with just four hits. And yesterday he was one for five. One out, base is empty in game seven at the Metrodome. Think about Joe McGrain for a second. When Joe McGrain started the season, 
he's in the minor leagues. He's in Louisville on opening day. And here he is on closing day pitching for the world championship. Called up when Tudor broke his leg back in April after a good spring. The injury to Tudor got McGrain to the majors earlier than Whitey Herzog had anticipated. And he made the most of the opportunity. Dagny around the bun and missing for strike two. He was trying to push that ball between McGrain and Lindemann. Lindemann playing deep. You can play deep with two strikes, but a good idea by Greg Gagney. See, he wants to push it, and it's a good thing to do against the left-handed pitcher because all left-handers fall toward third base. So that gives you an even bigger hole to bunt the ball between the first baseman and the pitcher. Oh, and to the count. One out of the base is empty. Joe McGrain has moved around in his life. His father right now teaching at Moorhead State University in Kentucky. But part of McGrain's childhood was spent in this area. And he pitched in this ballpark as a collegian. He went to the University of Arizona and faced Minnesota a couple of years ago in the Metrodome. And he gets it. Ran it down and in on Gagney. And there are two gone with Kirby Puckett coming up. And this is a point that you alluded to all series, Timmy. When you get ahead, you can make the hitter expand the strike zone. What for this ball? It's an obvious ball, but you got to go at it. Tight spin on the breaking ball. Take another look. Makes him expand the zone, and he swings at the pitcher's pitch. That's that disappearing slider. It serves as the illusion of a strike, but it's got a late break to it, similar to the idol of Joe McGrain. When he was growing up, Steve Carlton. Mm -hmm. And he finally got to meet Steve, in fact, the other night in St. Louis. He did indeed. Strike. 0 and 1. And as glib as he is, he, he was almost speechless. He really was. We, of course, were all were all there, and Joe came up to meet Steve, and he was it was just wonderful. I mean, seeing the the expression on his face like a, a little nine year old boy meeting Steve Carlton instead of a, a guy pitching the seventh game of the World Series. Well it's funny because a lot of players block several things out but McGrain is the kind of guy that he knows where he is and he's relishing and trying to savor every moment. Obviously he's thinking about taking care of the twins but he is the kind of guy and we've gotten to know him a, a little bit over the past couple of weeks who is fully aware of this particular point in time and what it means and at this particular point in time I think he crossed up Steve Lake and I believe I mean, they're they're concerned about maybe the twins have their signs and Whitey more or less eluded 29 runs it looks like they're hitting all kinds of pitches so I imagine they're using different sequences even with nobody on just to kind of confuse the twins in case they are getting pictures and uh, right there he crossed him up. You don't want that to happen with somebody on a runner on third or something like that. Yeah you want to keep signs simple enough to get but difficult enough to not have them being stolen. Two out bases empty and one and one the count on Puckett. Hit slowly toward third lawless throws low scoop late. It beats it out for an infield single. A lot of times when infielders feel the ball, they feel the ball in the web, and instead of throwing it with two fingers, they throw it with three fingers. I think that's what happened to Lawless on that play. A very close play at first base, but that ring finger is for rings. It's not used for throwing. Well, we've seen Tom Lawless. Saw him in uh, game one. Does not have a strong arm. I really believe he has to play a little more shallower yep. with a fast runner, yep. even with two strikes. You do give up something on the sharply hit balls with by playing more shallow on the rug, however. Gary Gaetti takes low ball one. One to go. Oh, well, he's out. Yeah, he was out. Very close play. Again, if I don't mean a radical departure from where you normally play, yeah. but a step or two. I mean, a guy like Pendleton can play where he wants to because he's got a strong arm. Wallace doesn't have that. Two and all, the count on Gaetti. 
Because if you go back to the infamous fourth inning in the first game, and I was talking to Brain, he said, you think they have my size? And it was a roller to Lawless, and a broken bat hit up the middle, then a bad pitch, Bernanski line drive. Herbeck followed with a grounder up the middle. Not exactly a lot of hard hit balls, but what contributed was walks. 2-0 to Gaetti. 2-1. Rick Rennick coaching at third. And Gaetti looking down to see if Puckett will be in motion. Rick Rennick, the third base coach, a what could have been a very serious fall last night. He fell down a flight of stairs with his hands in his pocket. You see a black eye, his right eye black, so we're thankful that Rick's not hurt. Two and one the count. And it's hit toward the gap and right center field, but racing over is Okendo, and he makes the catch. Great play by Jose. No score after one. Some outfielders, when they're going to their right, would elect to backhand this ball, but you see that little loop that Okendo takes, and he makes a fine running catch. And as he came back to the dugout, and even finer considering, again, the roof and also the crowd with not only the white Homer Hankies, but a lot of people wearing those white Minnesota Twins American League champion sweatshirts. Well, that's what Ozzie Smith said yesterday. He said, we haven't beaten ourselves. In fact, the Twins played worse than the, the Cardinals. What happened is they just got blown out of the ballpark. So defense so much of their game. Jim Lindemann starts the second inning by looping one into center field for a base hit. So Lindemann is five for 13 in the World Series, playing in a platoon role. The rookie leads off with a base hit in the second inning, and Willie McGee comes up. McGee with the most hits of anybody in the series, nine, hitting 391. Everybody well aware that the Cardinals not only have to beat the Twins, but they have to keep the crowd out of the ball game the best way to do it is to get an early lead they did that last night until the fifth inning that's lined in the left for a base hit Gladden fields on the hop Lindemann stops at second and so the first two Cardinals get on here in the second inning and it will bring up Tony Pena who is the designated hitter well, exactly what Frank Viola was afraid of and you can see Dick Such saying up you take another look. Two high pitches, one to Lindemann, one to McGee. Look where it is. He has to be down in the strike zone. That's belt high in the middle of the plate. He cannot live there and be successful. Third consecutive start with three days rest. He said that doesn't make a whole lot of difference if you do it regularly over the course of a season. He has not done it. About the fifth or sixth time he's done it all year. Tony Pena, who had two sacrifices during the regular season. With the Twins having to protect against the bunt, but he's up there to swing away and takes low and in. Nick Leva flashing the signs from third, with Herbeck having to play in and Gaetti as well at first and third. A lot of times what determines whether you bunt or not is who's following you. I doubt that they'll bunt here with the bottom part of the order coming up. They've got Okendo on deck, but then you go to Lawless and Lake. Curve is hit to left field and down the line and deep, and it is a foul ball. Foul ball, says Ken Kaiser, with some emphasis as well. And again, another ball hit hard, a high curveball. Good idea, 1-0 and to come back with a curveball, but not in the position where he threw it. As you see the ball hooking, Viola gets away with a bad pitch. Pena out of front a little bit. He's not a pull hitter. We've been seeing him drive the ball to right field. Bob Kelly told me before the game that they will try to get Pena out with breaking ball. Too many fastballs have been fed to Tony so far in this series. Another fastball, though, is wrapped in the center for a base hit. Lindemann around third comes in to score. Stopping at second is McGee. Cardinals lead 1-0. Tom 
Kelly really frustrated before the game, saying, Tony Pena has been getting one fastball after the other. We've told all of our pitchers to throw breaking balls. Possibly the fact that he hit the breaking ball well resulted in this fastball. Exactly, and it was a good pitch in the sense that it was down, but if you know any scouting report on Pena, he likes the ball preferably away. So now O'Kendall, and it's the seventh game of the World Series, which means the bullpen. They will not wait. O'Kendall, the twins still having to guard against the bunt, first and second. He's up there to swing away and fouls it off. And it's going to be Bert Lyleb who gets up. He is working on two days rest, but there he is. He's got all winter to rest. Well, he was ready yesterday. In fact, he put his spikes on. They said, no, no, no way we will use you. And he said, just in case, and now he's up and throwing. One and one to count. To clarify that deal about Pena, you know, if the guy's a fastball hitter, that doesn't mean you can't throw him fastballs. What you try to do, however, is throw him fastballs where he can't hurt you. And with first and second, I would imagine that's what Tom was talking about, that if you're in a pinch, go right to the weakness of Pena. Game situations come at different parts of the game. Bob Bardozzi ducking in to keep McGee close to second. Willie at second base, and Pena at first. Nobody out in the second inning. Cardinals have jumped on top, one nothing. Popped up, and the infield fly rule is in effect. Herbeck makes it official. One away in the second inning. I don't know if the Twins could hear each other, but Herbeck was going to make sure Lombardozzi didn't come anywhere near him. And had Lombo come over, he would have gotten a black eye. Well, that's the difference. See, you'll see Herbeck never ever take his eye off the ball. You can't do that here. And that's the, the problems that visiting teams have. You take your eye off the ball, you never pick it up again. One of the great lines during the playoffs was a banner saying Herbeck by a vowel. All he has to do <laughs> is look at his neighbor at second base. He can give him a couple. Bob Bardozzi or borrow one from Okendo, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Lawless takes a strike. And the count on one. And the last time Lawless faced Viola, Bush Stadium erupted in game four. Three run homer. 0 oh and 1 high fastball. I got the message right there that Viola was not throwing that well, only in the sense that he wasn't behind. Lawless, not a home run hitter, only two hits before that. Jumped on a high fastball and hit it about 300 and what, 65, 70 feet? Enough. In the air to right center field and deep, but Puckett has room and makes the catch on the track. McGee tags and goes to third. Pena retreats to first. So Tom Lawless, a deep drive again off Viola, but this time a long out, and it will bring up Steve Lake with runners at first and third and two down. Definitely a high ball hitter. This one, he, you can see where this one ends up. If he pulls it, it's a home run, but Viola went away up in the strike zone. Similar pitch that he hit for a home run, but instead of being inside, it was out in the outside part of the plate. I think Loudner out talking to Viola now and telling not only Viola, but Gagne and Lombardosi what he's going to do in case Pena tries to go to second. And the Cardinals tried to get a cheap run, which they may do with Steve Lake hitting Steve's first postseason at bat. He came in earlier in the series to catch the ninth inning. In game five, but didn't hit. And he hits it in the left field for a base hit. So another sudden hero. Two nothing as McGee scores. Steve Lake. Great line. He comes into the training room. He's watching the football game. And he says, one minute I'm watching the football game. The next time I'm sorry, the seventh game of a World Series. First pitch base hit. Down middle of the plate. As a matter of fact, Jim, Steve was telling both Al and me that he could be the hero tonight. He said, look at all the heroes so far. He said, I'm the only Scrabini who hasn't started. Right. 
Two out, first and second. Coleman swings and misses. The one thing you got to love about a Steve Lake, he was telling me a story the other night. Talk about life imitating art, imitating life imitating art. He watches the beginning of a game of the World Series on television in the clubhouse, and then he says, wait a minute, I'm here. And he opens up the doors, and he says, there it is. I walk into the stadium, and I'm in uniform. He said, it wasn't official, though, until I heard the opening billboards. One and one. Well, such a major part in their season when Pena broke his thumb. He played early in the year. And the reason McGrain is having him as his catcher tonight is because they've had such a great success. It was five and one with McGrain. Throws well, and he can hit. Two and one, the count on Coleman. So Bly Lemon still in the bullpen. Back of Viola, 2-0 St. Louis in the second inning. And there he is, Viola, a 6-0-4 ERA, pitching under these circumstances, and 281 when he gets his rest. To shallow center field, Lombardozzi and Gagne go out, and it's Gagne for the count. The Cardinals parlay four singles into two runs and a 2-0 lead in the middle of the second inning. little in between psychology from Dick Such the pitching coach and that's what of course pitching coaches do keep help you with your mechanics but sometimes soothe your soul I'll tell you I'd rather have a hitting instructor as a batter soothe my soul than help me with mechanics <laughs> <laughs> I think I really I think that's what batting practice is for I don't think that belongs in a game unless it's blatant Don Baylor to start the bottom of the second inning. 2 0 St. Louis taking a strike. Baylor, Brunansky, and a Herbeck. Don Baylor with the Red Sox until August. Twins picked them up prior to the deadline. And his first homer as a twin came yesterday. And what a homer. It tied the game. And eventually the Minnesota went on to win 11 5. Joe McGrain. Baseball, so shaking it off. A oh, breaking ball with one strike. You can't really see from that angle, but this is why, even though he's hit, and you'll take, watch the ball spin away and hit Davey Phillips, first thing he does is look at the first base umpire for some help. Right there out of frame, he, even though he's probably hurting. Yeah. And he gets the affirmation from Lee Wire. Great. In the line of duty. In agony, he still makes the call, and Taylor gets hit by the pitch. And that's nothing new. About the 226th time in his career. Anytime you work Baylor inside, you're going to run that risk. Well, it's one of his defensive measures, really, and that's not a, a applicable here because it's a breaking ball, but his big weakness is up and in, so he just turns into the ball and takes that away from the opposing pitcher. That yep. time a breaking ball hits him in the foot. Yeah, Jimmy Don was hit 255 times. As a matter of fact, he broke Ron Hunt's record. The hunter was hit 243 times. But usually it's not hit in that particular fashion with the breaking ball down and in. Brunansky. Fastball low, one and oh. McGrain's reaction after hitting Baylor. Especially when you get ahead of the count. Head in the count, head of the game, leadoff batter. A lot of reasons he's disappointed. One and oh. Brunansky, nobody out. Bottom of the second, two nothing cards. Toward the whole base hit. Baylor stops at second. That's the thing about the Twins in this ballpark. They refuse to let you take the crowd out of the game. They bounced right back last night, and they're trying to do it again this evening. Ken Herbeck, first and second, and nobody out. One and all. Oh. 
mean, that's fine to start Herbeck off with a breaking ball, but I would think he is looking for a fastball, trying to drive it. And afford to look for his pitch here and see what McGrain does. Two and down. Lawless visits McGrain. about this crowd it's almost as though they should go to spring training with the twins you got to be physical to watch Boy. a game here Woo. Interesting. After you hit a grand slam, you've been in a slump. You'd think you'd be a, you're not aggressive enough. To, and you can see right there, one hit in the 13s, and that's the grand slam off Kent Daly yesterday. He's taken some close pitches, pitches you'd think he'd swing at, not to criticize him, but he's been very patient. Three and two on her back. Send the runners here. Okay. I don't. Uh, it's tough. Even though you do have a double play hitter hitting. Got a ground ball pitcher. Herbeck struck out 60 times, not that much for oh. a power hitter, but he grounded oh. into 13 double plays. Tough ball here. Runners don't go, and he strikes out swinging. And that's a case where maybe they go if it's a right handed. Pitcher, but not against the lefty and how big now is that check swing strike now that he's gone on strikes well right in his power low ball hitter low pitch and it sinks that's the key three and two McGrain has such a live arm you think the ball is going to stay and you can see right there to the, the pleasure of the, with John Macheri that Kent Herbeck displays well the great thing about this game is that there's no way the umpire can hear you from that distance you're never going to get thrown out. No. Laudner rips it foul into the fourth row. You could kind of see this coming. Watch Herbie, as he's affectionately known by his teammate, start his verbal barrage toward John McSherry. Jerry, part of the heftiest umpiring crew in history. Strike two. Oh, and two on Laudner. Tim did not join the hit parade yesterday. Performed well early in the series, but as you see, now down to 263, and he was 0 for 5 in Minnesota's 15 hit barrage yesterday afternoon. Baylor is at second. Rumansky at first. One out in the second inning. Two nothing cards. One and two. I, I think that Steve Lake was asking where that pitch was. Again, it's very hard to talk. To a catcher or a catcher talking to an umpire, but that curveball, the only place it was, was around the plate. Pretty good pitch. That's ground into the hole for a base hit. Baylor is being waved in. Here comes Coleman's throw to Lake. They get him. What a throw. Rodansky stops at second. I 
I'll tell you, if you're going to trade that out, Vince Coleman with 16 assists on the year, second to Glenn Wilson of the Phillies, who led the National League with 19. But we brought this up earlier. The reason he is so good at that, he charges the ball. But in my opinion, Bernanski and Lavner should move up on this play because of the ball being hit so sharply. I'll tell you, it looked like a high tag to me. The ball looks like he's beat safe. Him. Looks like he's safe, but because the ball beat him, the little short hop and the tag. Yeah, oh, he tags yeah, him sir. high. Yeah, he's safe. Oh, yeah. Some of the people are booing. It's, they didn't put it up on the big screen, but there are enough private boxes here that have televisions, and they saw what you saw. So you get uh, about 20% of the folks booing, and those with the portable televisions as well. Pitch up and away. If they put that up on the big screen, this place would have come apart. You take a look again. Looks like Baylor's right leg way across the plate oh, before yeah. Steve tags him up the leg. Yeah. More people have access to television monitors, and that's the, the booing you're hearing. Lombardozzi with the count 1 0. Oh. Getting back to the other base runners, you saw Don Baylor thrown out trying to. You know, Don doesn't run that well. If you're the runner at first base, you've got to look for the throw if it's too high. That's what determines whether you go to third or not. A ball hit that sharply. The chances of a pretty good throwing outfielder like Coleman getting Baylor is pretty good. And he did nail him, but in the course of nailing him, you want to move your runners up 90 feet. Both Loudner and Bernanski. Crowd is chanting safe, safe, safe. He was. But the ball beat him by such a large margin. I can understand how Davey Phillips missed that call. And that's the type of call. It's not that uncommon. You right. see that play happen a lot. High tag, foot there, but out. 2-0 and on Lombardozzi. And that's wrapped in the center field for a base hit. Romanski will come in to score, throw in the second, getting back in there. Look where it is, Bell High, middle of the plate. Lombardosi, three hits yesterday, is on a hot streak. Today is no exception. McGee with a smart play, throws behind the runner, but he almost gets Laudner at second. Knew he did not have a chance. Good play by Willie McGee. Dan Blatt grounded out in the first inning. Three hits and a hit batsman here in the second. Change missing one and oh. Whitey, a new posture, a new position, but he has to send Cox to the pen. One and one on Gladden. This has the makings, at least at the outset, of a very wild game. You've got Viola definitely struggling, working on three days rest. The rookie McGrain, the long man with two days rest, and Cox. And the Metrodome. Good fastball. It appears that Steve Lake is giving positioning to Joe McGrain, and it's the first spot he touches. If it's his left leg, first, it's inside. The right leg, it's outside. And when you get position, usually it's a fastball. Let's see if it's inside again. Two and two. Breaking ball. So what, what you said is Steve Carlton, who you caught for years, was a fastball, basically a way slider in. So you can throw and show position on a breaking ball if you throw a hard slider, and that's what the grain's throwing. 
certainly doesn't want it out over the plate if he throws him a breaking ball. Inside again. Popped up. Tommy hurries there. And he stays with it. Twins get a run. Two one cards after two back after this from your local station. Not only do, do you at home have the best view of that play with Baylor sliding in, but you would think Davey Phillips would have the same view of that play. The difference is it's happening much quicker. We mentioned that no World Series has ever gone the distance with the home team winning every game. They've come close on those four occasions, but in each instance, the visiting team won game seven. Ozzie Smith starts the third with a chopper to third, and he's thrown out by Guy Eddy. Watch a play every day, and you really appreciate it. The G-Man. I only had to watch him about 13 games a year, and I appreciate it. But Ozzie Smith, the, the only way to hit this ball, you see Guy Eddy backpedal playing in for the bunt and an awfully strong arm. See how Shally's playing, sets himself. He's got a gun for an arm. They call it a rifle, and he throws him out easily. That ball's over his head. He's got to be looking fastball. He jumped on it, wasn't able to get a base hit. Tommy Hur with one out. Tries to bunt his way on, but foul. 0-1 on a Hur. Tommy grounded out in the first inning. One out, bases empty. We're in the third inning of game seven. Cardinals on top, 2-1. Six pitches through two innings. That's really not an inordinately high number, but the results have not been good because, speaking of high, he's been up in the strike zone. 0 oh, 1 to Her. It foul on the count, nothing in two. Then they've been on deck. Tommy Her has a most unusual batting style. It's almost like both feet are doing a pitter pattering motion before he swings. Most hitters dig in with their back feet. Not true with her. But yeah. you'd also call him a front foot hitter, which yeah. is why he doesn't yeah. have a lot of power. Most home run hitters really do pivot off that back foot, throw right. their hips, and he slides forward. One and two. Again, does not have the physical characteristics or makeup of a home run hitter, and he does what he does best, which is hit the ball back up the middle, Bush Stadium being a huge ballpark. A lot of times there you see that little pitter-patter motion of Tommy Herr. It's almost a rhythm. Uh-huh. Half swing foul. A lot of times what determines whether a guy's going to be a home run hitter or not is not only power, it's lift in the swing. And as Jim pointed out, with that much movement, you're more likely to hit the top half of the ball and therefore not have as much lift as if you were to hit off your back leg. He got a little bit of lift yesterday. Batting from the left side, he lifted it right into the upper deck. Gave the Cardinals a momentary lift. <laughs> yes, he did. Foul away again, and still the ball and two strikes on Tommy Herr. Two runs, four hits for the Cards. One run, four hits for the Twins. Twins are trying to win their first ever World Series title since moving to Minnesota. The only time that this franchise has won a world championship was back in 1924 when they were the Washington Senators. Cards, of course, have won it as recently as 1982. And that's line foul. Twins in the World Series for the second time ever, the other time 1965. When they went seven with the Dodgers, the seventh game was played at Old Metropolitan Stadium in Bloomington. The difference was that day, Minnesota faced a fellow by the name of Koufax. Two days rest, ten strikeouts, two nothing victory. Good, James Kerr got it her way out in front. Well, that's what you can do when you get ahead. You can take a little something off. The ball ends up being almost a perfect pitch, maybe a little bit low. Where Laudner catches it. 
way out. You watch him reach, 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 reach out on his front foot. That's what you want. You swing at the motion. Try to pick it up as quickly as you can, but that's the definition of a good curveball. He just has that tight spin. You don't really recognize it. Jim Lindeman has a fastball blown by him. 0-1. Rap foul, and it's 0-2. What's Lindemann's future? Well, they think of him as a right fielder. He's playing first base in the series because of the absence of Clark. And there is Jack Clark, ineligible for the series. And also a free agent. So if Clark comes back, then Lindemann does pick it to go to right. And if he doesn't for some reason, then it's another story. One and two to count. I've been very impressed with Jim Lindemann. He's battled all year long. He had a great spring training, great winter season. Of course, that is in the major leagues. You can see the postseason numbers, so he's really helped him get to the seventh game. The back problems have bothered him all year, and apparently I even see him with the hot packs every day. Good quick bat. Got him on a fastball. Three up, three down after two and a half. It's St. Louis two, Minnesota one. So much delay today. We're going to the bottom of the third inning. Game seven of the World Series. Al Michaels with Jim Palmer and Tim McCarver at the Metrodome. 2-1 cards. Gagne, Puckett, and Gaetti. Gagne struck out in the first. One and go. Rookie Joe McGrain. 23 years old. One and one. It's a funny game with McGrain pitching in the seventh game of the World Series. The crowd serenaded Roy Smalley of the Twins on his 35th birthday today. He's not in the lineup, but he has finally, after a long career, made it to the World Series. Then you take a look at, as we said yesterday, Gene Mock, a great manager for our money, and he's never been there. Takes funny twists and turns. And then there's Tom Kelly, a rookie manager at the age of 37, managing in the World Series and a possible world title. It's almost cruel the way Gene Mock has been treated in postseason play, as you see Tom, who could, if he wins this game, become the youngest manager since Lou Boudreau. Lou was 31 back in 1948, but he was a playing manager. Got him. Kept it in and down on him. And he's out of there. Well, same formula as Frank Viola. He gets ahead, and then Gagne chases a ball. Started out as a strike, but good sailing cut fastball in on the hands. And when it ended up, it was about six inches inside. Kirby Puckett had four hits yesterday and a single, an infield hit here tonight. So that's one shy of the series record. Goose Goslin did it in 24, and he was a, an old twin in a way as a member of the Washington Senators. Strike. Not until the World Series, doing a little preparation, did I read about that 1924 World Series and how the Washington Senators won two bad hops, one to tie it over Freddie Lindstrom's head, the other one scored muddy rule on a bad hop single in the 12th inning and the winning pitcher Walter Johnson. They beat the New York Giants and that's the last time a seventh game in the World Series went to X running. Second and last time. Puckett drives it to deep center field. McGee goes all the way back, leaps up and has it. Willie McGee does what Kirby Puckett does to so many in the American League. He robs them. saw how great a center fielder on the effort he made the other night in St. Louis. Right there, a little premature jump, but boy, does he get up there. Talking triple. And it, it's so true with 
another angle. You see a little short of the warning track. Not sure of the field here as much as he would in Bush Stadium about Kirby Puckett. They said when he gets hot, and we've seen the five hits, it doesn't matter what you throw up there. I mean, that was a low and away curveball. He went out and raked it almost 410 feet to center field. Gaetti with two out of the bases empty. Lake taking that shot. Willie McGee. <laughs> and there are a few guys who can appreciate that play more than Puckett because he's, he's looked at that play from the other end a lot. This is a wonderful city to come to unless you're an outfielder. One open. In the dirt again, and it's 2-0. On the other hand, Jim, you can understand how Puckett can make plays like that because of the give of that hefty bag material. You can't do that into the hard rubber of most outfield fences, and I'm sure that's run through Kirby's mind. Just don't find the beam. Yeah, right. The beams that are between are on either side of the 4-8 sign, and there's that beam. That is hard. It's padded, but it's much harder that's than right. the stuff. That's right. That fence only being seven feet high, so if you, even though you're small of stature like Puckett, and you can jump four or five times, he's gone over that fence. Two out, bases empty. Two and zero oh on Gaetti. Lawless to Lindemann and off his glove. So a not so routine play as it turns out. And that's an error on Lindemann. The scoring is an assist on Lawless. That's the way a play like that is scored. And then an E3. But we've talked about the lack of arm strength. Right there, it gets the ball to him plenty of times, and he just drops it into the runner, but not that much that he shouldn't come up with it. Not exactly very smooth footwork, Timmy. That's his third error, and the Cardinals have made six. Lindemann has half of it. Yeah, it was almost like he was crossing across. It really looked awkward going after the ball. It looked like he reached before he really saw the throw. He made yeah, a stretch right. and then couldn't adjust. Uh -huh. Don Baylor with two out takes low ball one. you appreciate a Herbeck or a Hernandez or a Murray or a Mattingly. Guys that have such smooth feet you never know, notice really what they're doing around the bag. Grounded to Lindemann and he was almost ready to atone but it's a foul ball. You know that's not Lee Wire's call. The ball no. wasn't the first base. Lee Wire made the call. And I'm wondering if he was looking in at Davey Phillips because until it gets to the bag the call belongs to Dave Phillips. Right. So possibly Lee made the call after Phillips went up with both arms. Watch Davey Phillips right here. Home plate umpire. He doesn't have the angle. Ooh. I'll tell you, that's close. But it didn't look foul. Uh, close, yeah. Close. 1-1. One, one. Grounded foul. One and two. Dave Phillips didn't jump out right away, and I think Lee Wire had to make the call. Now, True Lindemann landed in foul territory. I'm sure we'll see it one more time or so. But before the ball reaches the first base bag, it's the home plate umpire's call, and Dave did not appear to jump out and look down the line in time to really be in a position to make that call. So Wire really necessarily had to make the call. Runner goes, pitches low and inside, and the throw, no chance. Giant jump, and Lake didn't have a prayer to throw Gaetti out. Another look now at the fair or foul. And this is not an easy call, but see for yourself. Mm. See, when he gloves that ball, I think he was in fair territory. I think he may have been right on the line. Mm -hmm. Obviously, his momentum took him into foul territory. Now that we've looked three times, I agree with you. <laughs> Maybe, you know. Two to the Baylor, got him swinging. So the error does no damage, and we'll move to the fourth in game seven. Still 2-1 St. Louis.
the key may be here. Watch Dave Phillips, the home plate umpire. As the ball approaches first base, Phillips doesn't get in the proper position to make that call. Consequently, Wire's not in the right position, and Phillips' arms go up after Wire makes the call. And the way it turns out, at least, it winds up inconsequential because Baylor strikes out. So it, as it turns out, has no effect. And in the fourth inning, McGee starts things off for the Cardinals. Yes and no. He only had to throw three or four more pitches, and it makes it a little more difficult. Two more to strike him out. So this works. Make your work a little bit harder. I mean, not a major happening. 1-0 pitch. And it's 1-1. One one. Certainly not like a home run on the next right. pitch. A lot of tough calls tonight. And we get to see him two or three times. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, two of them have involved Don Baylor. The out call at home and then the slicing ground ball down first. One and two on Willie McGee, McGee, Pena, and Okendo. Fourth inning at the Metrodome in game seven. One game for the title and the Cardinals lead two to one. Viola gets McGee. That is McGee. If you watch him in postseason, he's a real good hitter, has been, has won a, he's won a batting title, but he will strike out during the course of the season 50 times on pitches way out of the strike zone. Well, ninth time in this World Series, you can see he's disappointed again, just as Lindemann. He expanded the strike zone, and the key to really the way as you look at a disappointed Willie McGee is that Viola is getting ahead again, and they're chasing bad pitches. Has it, excuse me, hasn't really established his change up tonight, something that he used in the first game. He has struck out four, and he has struck out the last three, and he's retired five in a row. Pena fouls it away, and it's 0-1. That's that pitch you were talking about where Tom Kelly wants it in on his fist. The fastball instead of away, which has resulted in a base hit, come in on him, Tim. And also, you're in a position now to, to feed to a hitter's strength. There's nobody on base. Sometimes you get hurt doing that, but with nobody on, that's when you want to throw the fastball hitter the fastball. If they need more reason to make noise, a wave rolls around the Metrodome. Indoor wave. Surfs up. They ought to have a no wake rule in Major League Baseball. One and two on the ever smiling Pena. I think waves are becoming to crowds what leisure suits are to clothing. <laughs> Passe? Absolutely. <laughs> Way Passe. Passe. <laughs> Ancient history, yes. You mean you haven't seen Palmer's closet recently? <laughs> One and two to count on Pena. what he says. Why throw a strike when they'll swing at balls? What's this? I mean, he's throwing about 93 miles per hour, but why throw it in the zone? I mean, this is one of the few pitchers that can pitch within the strike zone, but if they're not going to make you, why do it? Okendo well, grounds it to Gaetti. Who corrals it and throws it out. Seven straight, sit down by Iola. Three and a half, two one Hartle. We're going to the bottom of the fourth. Al Michaels, Jim Palmer, and Tim McCarver. Game seven of the World Series. Tom Brunanski leads off for the Twins with the Cardinals on top, two to one. And he hits it in the air to shallow left field. Coleman comes charging in, puts it away. One pitch and one gun. And it will bring up Ken Herbeck. 
all of the scoring in the second inning. The Cardinals with four singles for their two runs. And then the Twins, a hit batsman, and then three singles to net one run. And they also had what would have been the tying run thrown out at the plate when Don Baylor was cut down. I say would have been the tying run. That would have been the first run, and then they subsequently scored. And Herbeck, of all things, bunts to try to get on, and he's out. Lefty against lefty, and even though he took daily deep yesterday, he was struck out by McGrain in the second, and he figured he was trying to cross him up. Well, excellent play by McGrain. 6'6", six, six, bounces off the mound. You can see where Lawless is playing. He gets a better bunt down, but you work on this all spring, and pays off in the seventh game of a World Series. Not an easy play. you got to turn around and wheel, pick up the first baseman. Herbeck does not run that well, and he makes an excellent throw to Lindemann. So two down, base is empty in the bottom of the fourth inning. Laudner the hitter. McGrain has almost gotten Herzog where he wants to be because he was deathly afraid of McGrain getting bombed early. And then he would have had to go to Cox or Tunnel, and he didn't want to do that early on. Now he's almost to the point where he can count on Cox for an inning or two, and then you got Daly and Laurel. But an early knockout might have been disaster for the Cardinals. Well, he said his biggest problem all year has been middle relief, and I think it may be bothers if you look at Danny Cox two days rest. You really don't know how he's going to feel, but the desire is there, so you might see him later. Two and one. Whitey telling us before the game that everybody on the roster is available but Greg Matthews, the left-hander, and John Tudor, the left-hander. And Tom Pagnazzi has a touch of the flu, but he's available. And the Twins are all healthy. Starting game seven as rookies, you go back to Stalomeyer, the last to do it in 64 for the Yanks. Joe Black, who spent most of his career as a relief pitcher with the Dodgers, started a seventh game in 52. Second baseman in the New York Yankee chain, 21 years old, and at the game this evening, as are his parents. His parents look like his brother and sister. They really do. Laudner with no speed. Lindemann can afford to play behind him. Puts it away to end the fourth inning. At the end of four, still two to one Cardinals back after this word from your local station. You know, before the game, we talked about the mood before a seventh game. It's a tight game. What is the mood in the dugout in the middle of a tight seventh game? I think apprehension. You're, you're I mean, the trend here in this World Series has been big innings, and they've both been able to stay away from it. Looks like this is going to be the first game that may be decided by one run, something we haven't seen. I think the most relaxed guys in the ballpark are the guys on the field. Fifth inning. And Lawless, the number eight hitter, to be followed by Lake and Coleman. 2-1 St. Louis. Lawless flied out in the second inning. Frank Viola, who has set down the last seven. Lawless pops it up, and it's Herbeck in foul territory. Well, back
back in the second inning, he gave up four base hits, almost all of them on strikes in the strike zone. Now he has stayed out of the strike zone, thrown enough strikes to get ahead, and they are expanding the strike zone. That ball is almost over Lawless's head. So he's thrown well, and they're expanding the strike zone, and it's been a good result for Frank Viola and the Twins. Steve Lake now. Lake did a nice job along with Pagnazzi earlier in the season. They picked up Tony Pena to solve their catching problems, and then Pena got hurt in April. And it was Lake and Pagnazzi who did a lot of good early work to get the Cardinals off and flying. One and one. A lot of hitters do that, and they do it. They check for hairline fractures. Usually you do that on the handle. Because you can actually hit when a bat is splintered a little bit, but not a lot. That's the end of that bat. Speaking of splinters. Yeah. <laughs> On a ground to the second. A broken bat. Ground ball to Lombardozzi. Two down. Viola has set down nine in a row after a tough second inning. And up comes Coleman with two down. He can pitch so much like the entire pitching staff was able to pitch all year. With the minute they get Jeff Reardon, 31 saves, and Baron Gare, you know as a starter, you go out there, pitch your six, seven strong innings. If your team can hit like the Twins can, you have a good chance of winning a ball game. Something they couldn't do last year. One and zero on Coleman. Two out, bases empty in the top of the fifth. And Whitey. I don't know if Whitey is superstitious or not, but he he issues the the patio furniture. Yeah, and 29 runs scored in three games. I'd move too. And we've never seen Whitey in <laughs> an <Yeah>. empty chair. <laughs> what a one. But think about Whitey through the years. We have seen him when we saw him in his beach furniture here earlier in the series, and he's always standing against that wall in St. Louis. Different seat tonight. One and two. This is normally not a good play with two out, nobody on. But if Coleman gets on first base, the chances of him getting the second are great. So that's why a bunt with two out, nobody on for a guy like Vince Coleman is a pretty good play. If Tim Laudner did it or Jim Lindemann or somebody, it would be a bad play. St. Louis Cardinals lead two to one. Almost everybody says in both the American and National League, you can't pitch high. This is four out of the last seven Cardinal hitters. Jim Lineman, Willie McGee. Take a look at Tony Pena. And to end it, Vince Coleman. <laughs> Fell that to Frank Sciola. <laughs> <laughs> as we saw the sign in the stand say. In the running for the Cy Young Award of the American League, along with many others. In the running, but the votes are in. Yes. just haven't been announced yet. Dan Gladden takes inside. 1-0. Gladden, Gagney, and Puckett, bottom of the fifth inning, and Danny Cox is throwing in the pen. McGrain has faced 18 men through four. It means he's going through the lineup now for the third time.
one of the big advantages, even though Glad has hit a grand slam home run, three and one with a one-run lead, you have to challenge the hitter. So you throw it to the middle of the plate, hope you get a strike, and he did. Smith, and that's as good as gold. One out. It is gold. <laughs> <laughs> The Midas touch, you say? <laughs> well, it's so obvious after seeing him play seven consecutive games, he just plays so differently than other shortstops. Acrobatically jumping over runners through from midair the other day. Gagney with one out. Gagney has struck out twice. To the right side, confusion by Lindemann. McGrain covers, and no, safe. McGrain thought he was there. Wire says no. Lindemann didn't know which way to go. He started the first, then he went for the ball. He didn't know where to be. And then he complicates it with a bad throw. It's behind Joe McGrain, and McGrain has to reach back for the ball, and then he can't find first base, or at least it didn't appear that he found it. See right here, he breaks right away. Sinker down and in. There you can see him moving. You're taught to do that in spring training. Any ball to the right side. Now, what's where the throw is? Left hand, it should be on that side. Right there, he doesn't look like he sees the bag. And when he gets there, if he ever does, Gagney's across the bag. See, he can't see it. If the throw was out in front of him, he would have had a chance to catch it. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, it looked like he did touch well, it. Well, he did, but and, and the re replay shows it, but... It wasn't done the proper way. So what you do is you give Lee Wire a confused look. Instead of just going over there and making it routine, now watch this. He's moving. They're talking about Lee Wire. And he's looking at the play, but it's not exactly a kick the bag and get off the bag like you're supposed to do. He made the play very difficult, but the play should have been called. Well, Jim Lindemann made it difficult. Yes. McGrain did everything he could to make it well, and he's out of there. It's a confused look and a hook. In comes Danny Cox with one out of the fifth. Happy trails to... Well, the responsibility right here, of course, is the throw is a little bit behind him. It looks like the Tucson two-step tried to tag it with his right leg, brushes it with his left. Again, this is the pitcher's play to call. The minute the ball is hit, you yell, I got it, you take it. And the play develops late. It looks like he brushes the base and then argues with Lee Wire. Again, didn't give him a good look, but it did appear he was out. Danny Cox now comes in to pitch on two days rest. He has not pitched in relief in three and a half years. In his major league career, he has pitched twice in relief, both times in 84. Here's Puckett. Gagney at first, one out. Rip toward the gap and right center field for extra bases up against the fence. Gagney around third on his way in. The game is tied on a double.
doing to him. I'm really surprised that Whitey does not have somebody up because if you're Danny Cox, you're going to tell him. And you can see that was on a high slider. You can see the graphic. You're going to tell him you feel great, but this is the day you usually throw between starts, not in the seventh game of a World Series. Northeast foot foul ball. The point I'm trying to make is you just don't know how you're going to feel. It's not something you've done before, at least not in recent years. So the will is there, but is the stuff there? And Whitey has one out in the bottom of the fifth inning. So he has at least four and two-thirds innings. And he's got Worrell, and he has Daly. Keeps the 
The ball was not hit sharply. Now watch Gaetti come trucking home. Coleman, as we pointed out, charges the ball well. And a catcher, all he wants to do is get it in his bare hand. The catcher's mitt is not designed for a slap tag. That's why it's a remarkable play by Steve Lake. Ooh. Gaetti has every right to nail Lake in that situation. Nothing else you can do. Ozzie Smith, it's a pop-up, caught by Gagne. One out in the top of the sixth, and Tommy Hur coming up. Watch the bench after Gaetti goes in hard to Lake. Watch the Cardinal bench. And Gene Gieselman leading the charge to make sure Lake was okay. The trainer, the first man out there. One gone. Tommy Herr takes inside ball one. Smelling salts, you betcha. Another look as Lake does what he has to, and so does Guy Eddy. Reminds me of the 70 All-Star game, Fossey and Rose. Similar shot. Well, we were talking about Lake before he of the life imitates art, watching the open of the game on television and going through the double doors. He wishes this was art right now. But it's life. And he's feeling it. to worry about now is really not the left part of the body unless it's a knee or a hinge it's his throwing arm and even though he was hit on the left side by Gaetti he did fall on the throwing arm so maybe we won't know until the next half inning whether he's all right or not when he comes back out there and there's another problem two and two. if they had to take Lake out and catch Pena Pena is a designated hitter, and under the rules, that would mean the Cardinals would lose their designated hitter for the rest of the game, and the pitcher would have to hit. And so Whitey's really got a problem if Lake can't make it back out. The other catcher, Pagnazzi, has the flu. That's grounded in the center field for a base hit. So Tommy Hur with a one-out single, and Lindemann is the batter. 2-2 Two -two tie in the sixth inning. Lake right next to Gieselman. And Danny Cox on the other side. That's what I'm saying about Cox. He, you know, he throws one fastball and puck it doubles. Baylor hits the slider to left field. So it doesn't look like he's real strong. Meanwhile, Viola had retired 11 in a row. Now her at first base. And Lindemann at the plate. Makes a strike. Hold on. I tell you, Vince Coleman deserves a lot of credit because he gave Lake a chance both times by getting the ball to him as quickly as possible. Vince with 16 assists on the year, and none of his assists in his major league career have been as important as the two tonight. Two tonight that ties a record, a World Series record held by many, two in a game. Jim Lindemann. <laughs> Kelly and such and such is going to go to the phone. Meaning bullpen. Shatsuda to the lefty. Play by 
by Herbeck. Very quick. You're so surprised at how quick Ken Herbeck at 260 pounds or 50 pounds is. That's a tough play. You've got to go around the runner to make the play. A lot more difficult than it appears. One and two. One out. Two and two on Lindemann with McGee to follow. It appears to me, Tim, that he's really trying to be careful with Lindemann. You throw a fastball out over the plate, he had a home run swing. He's had three hits off him in the last two games. So you can see Laudner trying to move in, but once again, as he has done to Tommy Herr, he's run the count to two and two. Has to throw a strike or has to be around the plate. Full count now on Lindemann with her at first base. I would suspect he'll be going. Bet the ranch on it. And he can run 19 stolen bases during the regular season and only been thrown out four times. So not only a pretty good base runner as far as speed, but in this situation, doesn't mean you don't have to be too smart. The one thing you have to do, though, here is make sure he pitches. Viola with a good move. It's up to the hitter to put the ball in play, similar to a hit and run. He goes, and it's pop foul back out of play. So three and two on Lindemann. Cardinals got two runs in the second. Twins with one in the second, including a man thrown out at the plate in that inning. And one in the fifth. And another man thrown out at the plate. And you can look for the second baseman to be covering. I would assume her will be going again. Lindemann has shown that he rarely hits the ball on the ground the other way. Therefore, the second baseman, Lombardosi, should be covering. Her goes, Lindemann pops it up, and back out of play. What makes it a little bit easier, I guess, from a pitcher's standpoint, is that three and two, one out, you have to throw a strike. So you take a little bit longer, and really at this point, you'll sacrifice a stolen base for not walking Lindemann. Not something you want to do, but the three-two count dictates that you have to come into the hitter. rush your delivery, try to get rid of the ball too quickly, and end up walking and create the first and second situation. And they have her picked off. Her back to Lombardozzi, to Viola. Viola back up on the play, and Hacker says, how can you possibly call it out? And here comes Herzog, and good luck with Whitey and Wire here, with Lee hearing anything. Well, I'll tell you, from the naked eye, there was no way that Herr was out. But on the other hand, there is no way Tommy Herr can get picked off. As we mentioned earlier, it's up to the hitter to put the ball in play. And Tommy gets nailed here. You've got to make sure the pitcher goes home. What we said a couple of pitches ago. But he is clearly safe. Herbeck almost, that's interference on top of it. He should oh, be awarded boy. second base. Two times. Absolutely. A fielder cannot block the base pass without the ball. So you have interference, and he's safe. Outside of that, no problem. Safe, as safe as there are months Ooh. in a year. Twelve of them. After a controversy free first six games, we've had enough for an entire series tonight. Fly ball off Lindemann's bat to Bernanski. End of a wild top of the six. Still 2-2. Two, two. Tommy Herb picked off on a 3-2 pitch. That's one thing that went wrong. Now watch the others as far as the rundown play is concerned. Herbeck, without the ball, illegally blocking her. Her should be awarded second base, and the tag by the pitcher Viola is late, and Wire had insult to injury, calls him out. And on top of that, Viola may have balked on his throw over there. <laughs> the hat trick. <laughs>
two of them. Well, Lombardozzi held it too long. Herbeck blocks Lee, Lee Wire. You won't see it right now. There's the interference. Viola doing his best. He's saying, why am I in? Right there, you see the blockage. He can't see what happened. He's blocked out on top of it. Viola says, I don't want to be in this play. Neither did Lee, I think. <laughs> Neither did Tommy. Oh. Want to know the count on Bernanski. 2-0. And the thing about the, the crowd here is so loud. That's the type of play where if Herzog can't be heard, he's out there a lot longer. I'm not too sure that Whitey was arguing about interference. I think he was arguing about the out call. If he's arguing about interference, he may have asked for help from Dave Phillips, the home plate umpire, who had a better view. 2-0 pitch is a strike. It's futile, though. It's it's ridiculous to attempt to have an argument with somebody here. You just can't hear a man standing next to you. You could go inside. Yeah, right. <laughs> Step in here, sir. <laughs> I'll tell you, if the instant replay comes in in baseball, it'll come into this ballpark first. Three and one. Danny Cox still struggling. Remember, Cox has faced three men, gave up a double to Puckett, walked Gaetti and gave up a single to Baylor and only got out of the inning because Coleman threw Gaetti out. And he walks it. So he has yet to retire a man on his own. And Herbeck comes up. Well, what you said early in the pre-game show is so true. Cox is facing a guy that's got as many home runs as the entire Cardinal team, 32, and you don't know what you have. You know the guy can hit a home run. You're trying to make your pitch, and he's been unable to do it so far. He faced Bernanski with 32, and now he faces Herbeck, who had 34 during the regular year. Struck out, grounded out. 28 of them off right-handers. 20 in this ballpark. A couple more numbers. Rourke nodding, and the nod means as Whitey faces activity in the pen. Might be Worrell who gets up. Two and zero. Oh. And it is. It's Todd Worrell. And here comes Ward. One advantage that Herzog has in a game like this, as opposed to a game in the National League Park, if he does go with Worrell and it's early. He doesn't have to worry about hitting for the pitcher. With a DH, you just go through the lineup, of course, so you can leave him in as long as he's strong. Well, another advantage is he has Ken Daly behind Worrell, and, and Daly is better against right-hand hitters, at least a lot, or at least a lot of the twin right-handers hit better against righties than they do lefties. So the matchup that seems something you don't want to really cause shouldn't affect him that much. On top of that, Worrell may be used to get out of this inning and work maybe one more before they make a move because really you can you can make a case for this being a very big inning if they score here the Cardinals a tough time playing catch up ball so maybe he's using him as a short man even though it's a sixth inning Bernanski at first and the pitch is a change for a strike two and one on Herbeck Two-two tie. Bottom of the sixth. Nobody out. Three and one. Well, that's back-to-back -back change ups and the last time Fox threw three back-to-back -back change ups. Randy Bush with the bases loaded. Back in game two, hit a double down the right field line. First and second. I think you may see Steve Lake go out and talk to Cox again. Yep, that's what Whitey just told him to do. And there he goes. You got to buy time right now. Worrell hasn't been warming up that much. The whole infield is going to help buy some time here. And also, they've got to discuss. All the possibilities with first and second and nobody out. And you've got to get that close to be heard. That's a tight-knit group. Yeah, the interesting thing 
important here is that Cox is a better fielder than Warrell. Whitey's going to make the move here. Warrell is not one of the better Cardinal fielders. Very tall. Cox a much better fielder. So Todd maybe can run it with a bunting situation when he gets in there. But I think Whitey feels Cox just doesn't have it. He's walked yeah. three. He's given up a single and a double, and he can't go any longer. And Danny says, hey, man, I tried my best. And there's a few words for the umpire as well. Until we Well, Danny Cox departing and then departing from the scene as Davey Phillips as he voices his displeasure. I didn't see any questionable pitches, not even close. I didn't either. But the same thing that uh, allows Cox to maybe get thrown out is the reason I think Whitey Harzok went to him, as you see the toss by Davey Phillips. He's got great character, wants the ball in the big games, and even though he may not have been on, he wanted to pitch, and he wasn't able to do it very effectively. Just couldn't do it. Now Worrell, nobody out. With Grumanski at second and Herbeck at first, and the Cardinals have to protect against the bunt with Lodner at the plate. He squares and looks at a strike with Lindemann charging and Lawless on that plate backing up to cover third. A perfect uh, play situation to, to have a guy that that's bunning. You have a guy that throws about 96 miles per hour, throws the textbook high fastball that might induce a pop-up. You have a slow runner. You have raster turf where you have guys in charge. You have the situation normally where he will go to third, first baseman will charge, and you'll try to get the force at third. A lot of things can happen here. Lindemann charges. It's outside. They throw down a second, and Ozzy is able to scoop it out of the dirt. with the ball in his glove, trying to make Bernanski think that the ball got by him. Strong throw by Lake, but a short hop and a good play by Smith. Now watch him. It's exactly what he did. After the play, Ozzie waits a beat, and now he runs towards center, trying to decoy Bernanski. But Tom didn't buy it. Lindemann. 45 feet from home, and the pitch funded out and missed for a strike. One I'll and two. I tell you, Al, the interesting thing about the Cardinal defense right now, it's at its weakest on the corners. Normally, they would be having the rotation play on with Terry Pendleton coming in, but since Lawless is in third, lacks the experience on the rotation play, they're forced to play it straight up. The rotation play, the shortstop goes to third, the third baseman charges, the second baseman goes to first with the first baseman charge. One ball, two strikes. He swings away, pops it up in foul ground, playable for Lindemann. A big out. A big out. Still runners at first and second. Brunanski is the go-ahead run. And Herbeck at first. And now Lombard Dozy is being pulled back. And they will go to the bench. And it will be Roy Smalley on his 35th birthday. There's Gladden who will be next. And Smalley now, the switch hitter, coming up. One for two in this World Series. Both the bats off Warrell. Fly ball the other night in St. Louis double here in the second game to left center field. So he's seen Morrell. He knows how hard he throws. He's seen the movement of the ball. And still, I don't know if that's good enough preparation because we're talking about a guy that can throw. So Smalley coming up. Smalley is a switch hitter. He had 275 during the regular season. As a left-handed batter, he hit 277. He very rarely comes up right-handed. He was at the early stage of the year, the left-handed DH on a full-time basis. But now he comes off the bench. Matter of fact, I take it back. He did get the double here, but he's the one that hit the ball. And Lindemann booted it. Hit the ball very hard off Warrell that took a 
short hop and went by Lindemann into right field. Could have been a base hit, but they scored as an error. So the ball sharply both times up.
is not going to be as effective. He'll tell you the more I pitch, the better I pitch. And he has not been used that often in the last couple of days. One and two. That's how a guy like Warrell is going to get you out with a runner at third in less than two outs. Pop you up or strike you out. It's rare that he gets a lot of double play balls. Bernanski the go-ahead run at third. Herbeck at second. The pinch runner Newman at first. Got him. He chased it for the second out. We talked about the fastball. Now look at the slider. Second better pitch. Very tight. As we said, a slider slides. It looked like it's a fastball. You go out to hit it, and it slides away from you and down. Of course, he set him up with about 496 miles per hour fastballs, 95, whatever. So your second pitch becomes your best pitch. Did then. Uh-huh. Gagney up and in. We're talking about sliding. What about Lake on that last play and the pressure on a Steve Lake right now? Well, he has had some physical pressure on him twice, one from Don Baylor and the other from Gary Gaetti. One and one. Bases loaded, two down. Brunanski, Herbeck, Newman. Above his den. Telling Tom Lawless, Tom Lawless, I may go into the dugout. Lawless had to call time. He, Lawless has to go tell something to Orrell. Maybe Tom saw what the work was trying to say. And the only guy who could, for whom he would get his attention, was Tom Lawless. There's Lawless saying, Me? All right, just a second. Again, it does come back to communication, whether it's fly balls. It's just difficult to communicate here. You have to have your head in the dugout, which is somewhat of a distraction. Again, a right-handed pitcher. Can't see yeah, over the Cardinal dugout. Two and two. Three walks in the inning. Bases loaded, two out, two, two, tie. And they pick up the tradition down in the pen because the ringleader, Newman, is at first base. Full count, the runners will go.
assist, and then Wallace makes an excellent play, saves one run, nosedive, talked about his lack of arm strength. You should look at it from another angle. Saves one run right here, but makes the only throw he can on one hop. Gagney well across the bag. You know, Jim, with, with the runners running and Newman's speed, that, he might have saved two runs with that play. What you have to do. I mean, he's hit, he's got five out of the last six at bats. He's gotten hits and he's hit the ball sharply. But again, what they've done the last two days is throw him strikes. First five ball games, they didn't throw Kirby too many strikes, similar to what we just saw. Strike two. You really put that theory to the test. You cannot throw a strike on this pitch. A high fastball, a slider away. Just off the plate, low yep. away. You got to go to extremes, but you got to relax and let the ball go. You don't aim it. One and two. We're talking a guy with 28 home runs. We haven't seen any power in postseason play with the exception of that line drive to center. But he can turn on a ball. Something he couldn't do two years ago. That is back out of play. A ball and two strikes. Morell took something off it. Oh, it's that slider they struck Labden out on. Now, again, we talked about it yesterday. A lot of times you'll get a breaking ball up that will be up just high enough where the hitter thinks he can hit it, but he can't. That ball a little bit lower, we're talking four runs. Foul tip held by Lake, strike three. They get a run to take the lead. Three, two twins after six. Back after this from your local station. Seventh inning, a few things to mull over after this one. In the second inning, Don Baylor attempting to score on a base hit by Loudner. Now watch the high tag by Lake. Baylor was called out. In the fifth inning, Greg Gagney, a tapper right side to Lindemann. The throw behind McGrain, but watch McGrain clearly touch first base. Gagney calls safe. Her in the top of the sixth inning. The rundown play. Interference on Herbeck. Her safe at first. Her was called out. And all that through six as we go to the seventh. Three, two, Minnesota. Willie McGee, then Pena and Okendo. Frank Viola, and he's been on the bench a long time. It was a very, very long bottom of the sixth inning. One and one. Newman at second. And he's in the number nine spot. Brunanski all chasing it, but they can't make the play. Ken Herbeck he knows there's bounds. He looks right there at those, goes around, knows the configuration here. Almost gets to the ball, hits off the railing, and Al Newman with a spectacular play, but it yeah. doesn't count. How about that? <laughs> this is a weird game, I'm telling you. Newman made the catch off the fence. Yeah. 
That's hit sharply to short. Gagney backs up, guns him down. One down in the seventh inning. And Pena comes up. Check out Newman. He makes the catch off the wall, and now he wants it. Well, after what he's seen all night, you know, he figures yeah, anything sure. might go. That's right. Huh. Yeah. That's great. One to go on Peyton. Tom Kelly, when this season started in spring training, he was, without question, the most anonymous manager in the major leagues. I mean, even fans who follow baseball pretty closely were stumped when you said, who's managing the Twins? I think we know about it, along with a few million others now. Of course, being young has really been a tremendous boon to the, to the Twins because they say he's one of us. The boon to anybody. <laughs> being some, young, yeah. Some of them call him coach. Strike. One and one. Coach Kelly. Two and one. Again, relying on that fastball, and we've seen, been able to stay out of the strike zone with it. The changeups have come late in the game, so he's really been able to go to another pitch, something he didn't have in that second inning when they got four hits. Three and one, curveball in the bullpen. It's Baron Gare and Shatzeter. When you look at the Cardinal bench, Tommy Lawless can't wait to get up there after that three-run home runoff by Ola. He may not face him. I think that curveball is directly responsible for what you said about Tom Kelly. Two and one pitch. A guy doesn't hit a home run. They said they wanted to throw him breaking balls. Now he's behind in the count. Three and one. You'd want to go after him, or if you do, at least do it with a pitch you get over him. better than your curveball. In the air to right field, deep, Brunanski back and plays it off the bottom of the fence. Pena on his way to second and in with a double. Tony Pena with his second hit. And the tying run at second. Pardon me, out fastball away. And one of the most impressive players against the right field wall. You mentioned Yaz last night at Fenway. I think that's an excellent example. Because Brunanski not only feels the ball well, well he barehands balls off the wall. And it is in position to throw. I mean, Something you said earlier in the, the series, Al, that he told you the trick is to play it off the three. So he knows where to go. No wasted motion. Oh, no. He bare hands it in position to throw and at least makes it close. And nobody knows that corner like Brunanski. He's played here since the park opened in 82. Okendo. Hole for two. to left field because that's the tougher field to play here. They got Gladden. He had shoulder surgery and his arm came back, so they, they put Bernanski where he plays so well. But if you look at the configuration here, it's much more room to cover in left field. one by one, but you start counting the outs. See the end of Oquendo Kendall being fooled by a changeup down and away after he set him up with a fastball on the inside part of the plate. 
He's counting outs right now, and he's thinking about seven. Two out in the seven. Pena at second. Lawless, 0 for 2 tonight. Foul away, out of play, 0 and 1. Tom Lawless, the most extra of the extra men this year, all season with the cards, came up 25 times, got one hit in August, and one hit the last day of the season, hit 0 80. Still with that high fastball, and the Cardinal hitters just can't get on top of it. And that's the pitch he homered on. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. stadium. So here's, I mean, perfect example of what you're saying. Just because a guy hits a fastball one time doesn't mean you go away from it. If you did, you wouldn't have enough pitches. Pendleton did it twice yesterday, but Terry Pendleton's a guy who can run. If this is a good throw, he's out. And the Cardinals are out of a scoring opportunity. The first one since the second inning. Hit the base. Yeah. Hit third base. He looked at Gaetti, who was playing very deep, and figured, why not? One and two on Lawless, who lines it to center field right at Puckett. Seventh inning stretch. The Metrodome in Minneapolis. Gary Gaetti will lead off. He involved in this play at the plate in the fifth inning. No ill effects shown by Gaetti or Steve Lake. Of course, as you can see, Lake takes the brunt of it. Just holds on. Mm -hmm. So here we go, bottom of the seventh. Al Michaels, Jim Palmer, Tim McCarver. Game seven of the World Series. Three, two twins. Gaetti, Baylor, and Brunansky facing Todd Worrell in his second inning of relief. Strike. I'll tell you, when you think about it, this could have been a, a game that's out of control. Vince Coleman throws out two runners at the plate, and Tom Lawless makes that good play with the bases loaded with the runners running. The shallow center, McGee gets a late start, comes charging in, makes the catch on the run. Well, he plays a deep center anyway, and he caught that up near the heel of the glove. Todd Worrell ready to deliver. No oh, fastball. Gaetti pops it up in what is a routine play, as you see what Al was talking about. A long run for McGee. And right on the wrist. Out of the glove and the wrist. Again, you just don't see it that well here. Don Baylor, who got the losing share in last year's World Series. Looking for the big diamond now. 0-1. What a career. I remember when he played with the Orioles, Earl Weaver said he would be a most valuable player at some point. And he, I, at that point, I just didn't think that he was going to be a full hitter. He hit a lot of home runs. 1979, 36 home runs, or excuse me, 39 home runs, 136 RBIs. Fly ball on the right. Okendo, looking up into the Teflon, makes the catch. Two down. And Brunansky coming up. A reminder next Sunday, the New York City Marathon. 22,000 runners and the times at the bottom of the screen on ABC Sports. Brunansky 
Single flight out drew a walk. He has scored twice tonight. The other run was scored by Gagne. 3-2 Twins. Oh and one. Looking ahead to the eighth inning. Whitey's crew will send up Lake, Coleman, and Smith. Nine, one, and two. And in the bullpen for Minnesota, the Terminator, Jeff Reardon. One and one. He usually terminates games. The Twins may be hoping he's terminating a season. One and two. Morrell, very impressive mixing up his pitches. But well, one of the constants of the Cardinals all through the year, and we saw it in the fifth game in Bush Stadium and, and tonight, is their defense. Not a great offense with Clark and Templeton, Pendleton out, excuse me. But they keep you in the game with great defensive gems. Two and two. Lodner strapping up between Viola and Kelly. Popped up. Wallace circling. Stays with it. Nothing's routine. To the eight. Still 3-2 twins. Funny, in this age of instant gratification, if you don't have your socks knocked off early on, everybody says, oh, the World Series is pretty dull. And it takes a few games for it to build, and then you get to this point, like it, last year. It takes some time as the music uh, that was playing between innings twist and shout. It takes some time for things to build up to that crescendo, and this game certainly has not disappointed anybody. It's got my attention. Mm. And the oh. series, too. Yesterday's game, today's game. Here we go, eighth inning with Lake leading off and fouling it away. Nine, one, and two for the Cardinals. Lake, Coleman, and Smith. The president of the American League on the far left, Bobby Brown. And his opposite number, Bart Giamatti, also in the ballpark. Along with the commissioner. The Twins, six outs from the title. Broken bat, little roller, Gaetti. Coleman comes up. And so is his bat as Gaetti gobbles up this ground ball. We've told you all series. Gold Glover last year most likely win another one. Great power hitter and he gets the first out here in the eighth inning. Carl Polad and his family. Owner of the Twins. Coleman 0 for 3. Time for all the beach ball loose in the outfield. I'll tell you, I think the reason Frank Viola is still in this game, he's still throwing the ball well, yes. But Coleman is from the right side is 0 for 10. Ozzie Smith 0 for 8. Neither Smith or Coleman have a hit as a right-handed hitter. If Reardon were in there, they'd be hitting left-handed, of course. Foul back, 0 and 1. One out of the eighth inning. Plus, if they do get on, you have 150 stolen bases between the two. And Jeff Reardon, they've stolen eight for eight against him this year. And obviously, much easier to run on than Frank Viola. Romanski charging in. There, takes the play. the season percentage Oakland at 74 556 the twins well below that this year at 525 
just barely fouled. By Eddie, not on the line. But then again, I don't believe that's where Smith's going to hit. That was a mistake. So playing, playing the percentages. Weak grounder to Newman. Seven and a half gone. Three, two, Minnesota. Bottom of the eighth inning. The Metrodome is rocking. And that is a redundancy. The Metrodome has been rocking for a couple of weeks. Kelly with Viola between innings. You know, you wonder when he strikes that sort of pose, is he telling them, hey, you've given me everything you have. I may go with Weirden in the ninth. Maybe. I don't know. Well, it makes sense. I mean, you, you turn her around. You got to make them make a move of Lindemann with Reardon, the right hand hitter versus right hand. And then McGee, of course, he's hitting well from both sides. So then you're going with the guy that got you here. Well, of course, my had a lot to get him to the ninth, too. <laughs> Bottom of the eighth, 3 2 Minnesota. Herbeck leads off. They'll be followed by Lawner and Newman in the ninth inning. Her, Lindemann, and McGee for St. Louis. Of course, it's a mute point if Warrell doesn't do his job and contain the Twins in the bottom of the eighth. And he knows that. We know it. Now you at home know it. <laughs> Two and one on her back. The hands and countenance of John Tudor.
Newman bats for the first time in the game. As a left-handed batter, he had 178 this year. Hits it in the air. Coleman was playing him the slice anyway and makes the catch in foul territory. So two down. And Dan Gladden, who is old for four tonight, coming up. Ken Herbeck, born here, raised here, and not trying to be part of a world championship team here. No team trailing going into the ninth. 
Smith has ever won the seventh game of the series. 4-2 as we go to the ninth. Last year, when the twin season ended October 5th, Frank Viola was the winning pitcher. He beat Chicago 3-0, and that meant the Twins wound up 21 games out of first in sixth, ahead of only Seattle in the American League West. A year later, they are three outs away from the World Championship, and Jeff Reardon is trying to get the three outs. And a man so responsible for them getting here, along with Vlad and Baron Gare, the new players on the ball club this year. 31 saves, 35 last year. Montreal 41 the year before. The only relief pitcher in the last six years that's had over 20 saves. Fastball curveball. Her and then Kurt Ford is out on deck and then McGee. One and oh on Tommy who is one for three. Anything for a rally. And if you think that run in the eighth inning wasn't important, consider the fact that you really take away the meaningful running attack of the Cardinals. They can still run, but it's not going to be the tying run unless two are on. One and one. Gaetti and Herbeck both off the lines. That's another thing you can do when you have a more than one run lead in the ninth inning. Two and one. We ran into Reardon in the catacombs of the stadium and he said that inning he got yesterday he felt would help him. Three and two thirds inning in this World Series. Five base hits so the Cardinals have been able to get something going but line drives up the middle just making contact what they do best. Ball. Two and two. Like that, you can fool the young. I mean, that's true. 
what are you looking for here? He showed you both pitches. One's over 90 miles per hour. You got to look for the ball. Herbeck will run out of room. Two and two with one out, and the base is empty in the night. Four two, Minnesota. That's another thing that running the eighth did. It gives the pitcher the luxury of saying, here it is, hit it. It's a home run. It's still a one-run ball game.
consensus fourth, fifth, sixth place choice in the American League West with a manager not named until seven weeks had gone by in the offseason last year. With a 34-year-old general manager, Andy McPhail. A team that not long ago may have been headed elsewhere. Their future in Minnesota, seriously in doubt. Small crowds, the depths of the standings, and now this. And if you're looking for Tom Kelly in your picture, forget it. True to form, he said he would allow the players to celebrate on the field. He would wait on the bench, and that's what he did. And he told us he wouldn't be able to see this if he was out there. That's right. Tom Nieto on the left and Steve Lombardosi on the right. And that says everything. Still rocking. Viola beats Cox. And let's go to Reggie Jackson in the Twins locker room. Thank you very much, Al Michaels. And an obvious World Series scene. You see the commissioner on my left, Carl Polad, the owner of the Minnesota Twins here on my right, Bobby Brown. Dr. Bobby Brown, the president of the American League. Andy McPhail, the general manager, young fella here of the Minnesota Twins, and the youngest manager to win a World Series non-playing since John McGraw in 1905. Mr. Commissioner, will you present the World Series trophy to Mr. Pollard? Carl and to the entire Twins organization, this is a very special thing. They told me a few years ago that they shouldn't have had baseball in Minnesota, and you've made it uh, very real. It's a class organization. It was a great win. Congratulations to you, Carl. All right. All right. That thing's pretty heavy. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Peter. On behalf of the entire Twins organization, on behalf of everybody in this upper Midwest area that supported us, it's just a great thrill uh, speaking for the team and everyone here. And I, I just want to say I've never had a greater thrill in my life, and I'm sure that applies to the entire team and everybody else in the Twin City area. There we go. Tom Kelly, what do you think of the owner here? What do you think of your trophy? Well, I'm very happy that Mr. Uh, Pola gave me an opportunity to manage these fine bunch of young men, and I'm, I'm very proud of the, the guys, the way they played. You know, the outstanding effort against the Tigers, very good ball club, and to beat the Cardinals, uh, just an outstanding class organization, and we have to feel very proud. The thing I want to ask you, Tom, what did you say to Frank Viola in the middle of the eighth inning? Well, uh, I, we... I didn't want to take him out, but the way we've been going all season long, we didn't divert. In the ninth inning, Mr. Jeff Reardon gets the baseball, and that's the way we did it all year. Reardon's my man in the ninth. He gets the ball. That's all there is to it. Outstanding. Mr. Paul, let me ask you a question. Thank you. <laughs> I know that you've had some... You and Andy All right. Way to go. Super. Mr. Paul, I know, I know you've had some great thrills in your life. Uh, you, you can name it when it comes to uh, buying things, but a World Series trophy is something that all the dimes or all the pennies you can save in the world you can't buy. What's your feeling today? There, there's no way I can describe the feeling. I've been through many things in my life, pleasant and unpleasant. This is the greatest thrill, and the only way that you can really know how it feels is to be here, have it happen to you, and believe me, thanks to a great organization, Tom Kelly, Andy McPhail, and everyone else, it happened to us, and we're just grateful. We're grateful for the good Lord to uh, let us come through all this, and uh, I can't tell you how thrilled I am. I know the guys love you. I know the fans love you. When we come back, we will come back and we see the most valuable player trophy given to Mr. Frank Viola. All right. We'll be right back. Stay with us. There you go.